Friends, I placed a post on Twitter regarding the term covenant as it's been used in charismatic and Pentecostal circles for the last number of decades. And I want to share a little bit about it and the affirming things about it and the challenging things about it from my perspective reflecting back over the course of the last five decades. First, I want to talk a little bit about the phenomenon of buzzwords. They're quite common in all the fields of discipline you can imagine. Business, technology, politics, religion. And buzzwords can really be effective in capturing our attention in order to convey complex ideas in a succinct, in a succinct manner. But they also come with challenges. And I think it's important that we consider what those challenges are. When it comes to things like trend and relevance, buzzwords tend to emerge from current trends and shifts in society. Language changes, and certain words gain popularity because they resonate with contemporary ideas and concerns and even with innovations. Understanding the context behind a buzzword can indeed provide deeper insights into societal and cultural dynamics. They are part of a way that we believe communicates efficiently. So buzzwords can be useful shorthand. They encapsulate complex ideas into easily digestible terms. They can aid in communication, especially when addressing a specific audience familiar with the terminology. Again, in my generation, kingdom became a buzzword theologically. Positive, affirming, challenging at the same time, because then you have to ask, well, what do you mean by the kingdom? And that's when we get into the real challenges. Okay, we've made this statement about the kingdom. We're all talking about the kingdom, but are we all talking about it in a faithful way from a theological perspective? And certainly covenant is just like that. One of the things about buzzwords that we need to be aware of is that we risk oversimplifying something when we use it. They can simplify communication. However, there's a risk of oversimplifying complex concepts such as kingdom and covenant. And that can lead to profound misunderstandings as well as, listen carefully, superficial treatments of very important issues. And so there's a potential as a result for misuse. Buzzwords can be misused in a way that obscures and manipulates what the word is intended to convey. They can be employed to make something sound more innovative or important than it is, or evade providing detailed, clear explanations. Both ends of that spectrum. I've seen it more often than I care to admit. What ends up happening there is there's a loss of meaning. The more we use buzzwords, the more we lose their original meaning. And they become jargon. They become cliche. And they reduce their effectiveness in communication. And what ends up happening there is whether we realize it or not, we alienate the audiences we're talking to. Not everyone may be familiar with specific buzzwords based on whatever in-group you're a part of. And that leads to alienation and confusion. And it's important to consider the people's background that we're talking to and understanding when we're using particular in-group language and specialized terminology. So here's a reflection or two on buzzwords. The emergence of buzzwords reflects the dynamic nature of language. Language evolves over time. And it evolves with changes in society, changes in technology, changes in culture. And language adapts to new contexts and needs. It's one of the reasons there are so many contemporary translations of the ancient sacred texts. Now, many of those translations are wonderful. Some of them are challenging because they can cause certain realities to be reduced to something that they weren't intended based on the Greek or the Hebrew. 
Also, there's a need for critical engagement with buzzwords, questioning their origin, questioning their relevance, and the implications behind the use of those words. When we critically engage buzzwords, it actually helps us to discern whether they're being used appropriately or merely as a means to impress or persuade or manipulate without substance. And so balance in communication becomes really crucial. We have to learn how to strike a balance, those of us that speak often and speak publicly, between using buzzwords for efficiency and ensuring clarity and depth in communication. That is vital. And because that's vital, we need to learn how to tailor language to suit the audience's understanding while avoiding over-reliance on trendy terms. Now, for public speakers, for teachers, for pastors, for leaders, that is a skill worth sharpening, honing, <clears throat> and for some, even beginning to develop. There's a certain reflective usage that we need to understand about buzzwords. If we can regularly reflect on our own use of buzzwords, it can lead to being more mindful and effective as communicators. Now, David says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And, and I often look at that in a very narrow way when I'm talking about communication. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, correct? And the heart is both what I'm consciously aware of and the things that are at a deeper level unconsciously that are embedded there. And there are times I bring things to speech that are so deeply embedded I'm not even aware of the roots of those things. And sometimes those things are laced with meaning and freighted with emotion that may not quite be precisely what is intended or what needs to be said. And so when David says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, we need to realize that everything we say, we are saying in the presence of the God of creation, the God of redemption, the God of the universe. He hears and sees everything we say. And learning to be aware that the words we say are those that we will be held accountable for by the one who gave us the opportunity to speak so that we speak faithfully. And so we have to learn how to assess whether what we're saying is contributing to understanding or if it's being used as a crutch or taking away understanding. So let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So I actually need the strength of God to speak faithfully. And I also need his redemption when I don't speak quite so faithfully. And I need him to help me to course correct and to change what I say. I need God to redeem my words. All of us need God to redeem our words from time to time. And so buzzwords can be an educational opportunity. Anytime a new buzzword rises, it can be an opportunity for conversation, for education, for exploration. And in that, we can actually have some healthy dialogue and even debate about new words or new concepts and new cultural phenomena. And so buzzwords do play a significant role in contemporary discourse. Yet their effective use requires our awareness, it requires critical thinking skills, and it requires adaptability. And balancing the use of trendy terms with clear, inclusive, and meaningful communication that glorifies God through Christ by the Spirit will enhance our understanding and our engagement when we're speaking of God's stuff. Now, having said that, in my generation, 
One of the buzzwords became prolific in the 70s and the 80s, and then it had all sorts of iterations in the 90s and the turn of the millennium. That, 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 that buzzword is covenant. We would talk about covenant bonds. We would talk about covenant relationships. We would talk about covenant community. And so the issues of covenant language in the Pentecostal charismatic movement has evolved over the last many decades in several complex areas. And that includes our theological understanding, our practices as the church, and the potential misuse of it in the way we organize and structure relationships in the church. I remember back in the early 70s hearing the teachings on the term suntiki and diatiki, or suntike and diatike, two Greek words that are the words for making a pact or an agreement, covenant, both in the Septuagint and in the New Testament. Suntike is based on two parties making an agreement. Diatike is where one party makes the agreement and the other party simply receives what's going on. So, for example, in the covenant God makes with Abraham in Genesis, God puts Abraham to sleep. And God, uh, while Abraham is asleep, makes certain commitments and promises. And there's a flaming torch and a smoking, smoking oven passing between the pieces of the sacrifices that Abraham has laid out according to God's ordering. And essentially, God is making this covenant and actually endowing Abraham with the blessings as well as the challenges of those covenants. But Abraham is simply passive. Abraham isn't making a covenant here where he's the initiator and he's laying out the terms. Now, when Abraham and Abimelech make a covenant at Beersheba, and there are seven ewe lambs that are exchanged. That's suntiki. That's both parties have an equal part to play. But when it comes to our, our eternal covenant in Christ, God making the covenant, the everlasting covenant, in the sacrifice of Jesus, what we do is simply embrace and accept and believe. God has all the responsibility for effecting that which takes place. And so I think it's important to realize that in our earnest exploration of the New Testament, we encounter, as well as in the Old Testament, these terms in the Greek, suntiki, diatiki, and they're typically translated as covenant. Now, there's a difference. I just explained to you the difference. So simply using the term covenant isn't sufficient. Now we've reduced the meaning if we just use the term covenant. Because these words carry immense theological weight, especially when we consider the scope of God's promises and the pivotal sacrificial act of Christ Jesus. It's of utmost importance, beloved, to discern between the divine covenants revealed in Scripture that are made from Abraham to David, etc., 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 all the way through. Um, all the way to Christ and the commitments we make with one another. World of difference. The covenants of God are divine initiatives and they're imbued with eternal significance and they're rooted in his unchanging nature. On the other hand, our human commitments, they are valuable, but they're mutual agreements and they exist within the realm of our time and life, our temporal experiences. And that distinction isn't merely academic. It's essential for a correct understanding of our relationship with God, first and foremost, and then our relationship with one another. Because if we want to turn something that's tied to you and I to have the sacred weight of what's tied to God, we're already on unshaky, unhealthy theological ground. And so when we talk, for example, about covenant communities, we're talking about fostering a sense of shared purpose and commitment among believers. Yet it's vital 
to really be aware of the fact that we have to be careful not to blur the line between divine and human agreements, even here. And I guess because I've seen the best and the worst of this, I'm, I'm saying these are real challenges. Covenant language, when used to describe human commitments, needs to be clearly differentiated from its theological use. As a matter of fact, I'm arguing we need to start using those terms far more um, narrowly and less abundantly for many reasons. Look, in the rich heritage of our faith, the idea of covenant community can be a powerful catalyst for nurturing a shared sense of purpose and commitment among the faithful. The concept can bind us together in our journey of faith, indeed, and create a space where mutual support and spiritual growth are of utmost importance. However, it really is imperative to tread with discernment in that area. Why? We have to be vigilant not to obscure the distinct line that separates. I know I sound like a broken broken record, but you need to hear me because this is a concern. We have to be careful not to obscure the distinct line that separates divine covenants from human agreements. Because when we don't, then whoever seems to be managing these covenants can become toxic in their leadership. When we employ covenant language in the context of our human interactions and commitments, we have to do so with a clear understanding and with fear and trembling that as we articulate these things, that they're not on the same plane as theological covenants in Scripture. We have actually, I've seen that one too many times. We impose a theological weight on these covenants when in actual fact we're talking about human beings who already have struggles in communication, already have struggles with um, discerning good and evil. All of us wrestle with the human condition. And now we're trying to impose some sort of a divine standard that becomes really legalistic and authoritarian and controlling. And what happens then is that we lose all safeguards against misunderstanding our place as human beings, all of us, no matter what our position, no matter what our title, our place in the eternal purpose of the triune God and our relationships with one another. And so we need a holy reminder that while our bonds with each other are vital and life-giving, they're, they're of a totally different order than the covenants God has established with us as his image bearers and whom he is perfecting in the image and likeness of Jesus. What about guarding against abuse? Well, the integrity of our language and concepts in the faith require that as communities we hold this in paramount importance because there's so much abuse going on, especially when we speak of covenants. It's deeply concerning when the sacred terminology of covenant is misappropriated for authoritarian control or, listen carefully, financial gain. Such practices not only distort the true meaning of covenant, but also undermine the trust and the spiritual health of the community where these things are practiced. Transparency and accountability have to be the hallmarks of our leadership structures. And it's critical to maintain a clear line between genuine spiritual leadership and manipulative tactics. True leadership in a Christian context is not about exerting control, lording it over, or reaping personal benefits. It's about serving and nurturing the community. It's about kenosis the canonic life, the self-emptying, self-sacrificial life of Christ, which we are to put that attitude and that mind on as leaders as well as followers and lay our lives down for one another. And so it's a safeguard against the misuse of covenant language 
and we will be protecting the sanctity of our churches, our communities, and upholding the values of the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Now, there are also some psychological considerations that I think we need to be aware of, because from a psychological perspective, it's important for us to realize that maintaining autonomy and the ability to question or disagree is essential to human relationships. Healthy spiritual environments encourage personal growth, critical thinking, and they don't demand blind obedience. So, let me put that in a more expanded version. From a psychological standpoint, the health of our spiritual communities, our churches, uh, hinges significantly on the autonomy and freedom of all of its members. It's essential for individuals within our communities to maintain the liberty to think critically, to question, and to even respectfully disagree with leadership. That isn't a sign of discord. It's a hallmark of mature and healthy spiritual environments, sacred spaces that are safe spaces. A community that fosters understanding and convictions doesn't require blind obedience. Rather, it thrives on mutual respect, open dialogue, and a shared journey of discovery. Mm -hmm. That kind of an environment is conducive to a deepening of faith and understanding where each person's unique perspective and experience are valued. By nurturing those principles, we cultivate a community that's robust, dynamic, and anchored in a faith that's both thoughtful and heartfelt. Now, mind you, those that are in the category of apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, didactic, pastoral, if they're trained well and they know what they know, they can walk in enough humility to manage that. But if they're threatened by questions and they use what they know to control, they're revealing their own toxicity and insecurity. And I guess I've seen that as well. And all of us are susceptible to that. Spiritual authority is not the same as the Gentiles. In, when Jesus speaks of the Gentiles lording it over them, when, they're, when the disciples say, oh, I want to be the greatest in the kingdom. Yeah, okay. Do you know what you're asking, James? Do you know what you're asking, John? You want to sit on my throne? And only the Father can determine that. But you have no idea what you would have to go through to have that kind of reality take place in your life. And they will eventually discover that it's the cross-shaped life and they're all going to be martyred for it. And so what we need to do is to consider alternative ways of talking and practicing these kind of things. Listen carefully. In our endeavor to communicate clearly and effectively within our faith communities, it's really wise, I believe, at this season to choose our terminology with more care and precision. When we discuss the agreements and the commitments we make amongst ourselves as believers, it's a beneficial thing to use language that accurately reflects the nature of our understanding. Things like, terms like mutual agreement, shared commitment, community guidelines are far clearer and more appropriate than covenant. And they touch a deeper place they effectively describe the collaborative and consensual nature of our interactions with one another without the risk of being conflated with the deeper theological concept of covenants. That careful choice of language and words helps to maintain the integrity of our theological speech while providing a clear framework for our human interactions one with another. That kind of clarity in our communication fosters understanding and harmony within our communities and it ensures that our words are both true to our faith and relevant to our daily lives. And then there's this whole issue of education and discernment because part of what we're doing as a community is being spiritually formed in Christ. And so education is tied to teaching, it's tied to interaction, and when we understand that our community's spiritual vitality and understanding requires that we're educated about the historical and theological nuances of covenant language, 
it'll make a difference. And so if we can delve into the rich background of these terms, particularly as they're used in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and even perhaps in various places in church history, um, that we would cultivate a greater discernment among our members of how and when to use this kind of language in an appropriate way. That education is not academic, beloved. It's a journey into the heart of our faith. And it's where we discover the profound depths of God's promises and our relationship with him. Understanding the subtleties of biblical language and the historical circumstances that surround it, the ways in which those covenants were made and worked out in the ancient Near East, where there was a different understanding than the 21st century Western world, it will empower us as communities to engage those concepts with wisdom, being informed, being reverent, recognizing the inspiration and authority of the scripture, and ensuring that our use of covenant language is going to be grounded in its true meaning and significance. That kind of a well-informed approach not only will deepen our collective faith, but it'll safeguard misinterpretations that could lead us astray. Now let me talk about one more really sticky issue that's tied to this. We need to revisit financial practices when it comes to spiritual authority. And I think this is really, really important because um, I've seen the best and the worst of this as well. The use of covenant language to justify certain models of hierarchy when it comes to finance is something we need to revisit and reform. The application of covenant language in justifying hierarchical financial models within our church communities warrants a critical and discerning examination in the hour in which we live. And it's paramount to remember that financial stewardship in the context of our faith should be underpinned by principles of generosity, voluntariness, and utmost transparency. Those are the bedrocks upon which healthy spiritual communities are built. Using covenant language to create a sense of obligation or to impose financial structures that benefit a few against the very essence of our calling to serve and give selflessly is really, really something that we need to talk about and look at honestly and not hide from it. We have to guard against any practices that might be misconstrued in relation to the sacred concepts that end up serving our own organizational ends rather than the kingdom of God in Christ. Our financial dealings need to reflect the grace and liberality that our faith teaches. I think honor is given where honor is due. I'm not denying any of that. Um, but there are certain get-rich-quick schemes that are going on in leadership hierarchies that are deeply problematic and are going to incur the strictest judgment from Almighty God. Make no mistake, if it doesn't come now, it's going to come <laughs> at death, but it will incur strict judgment from the Lord of all the earth. And so our financial dealings need to reflect the grace and liberality of the faith ensuring that all of our resources are managed with integrity, with fairness, and congruent with our collective values and mission. In doing so, we honor not just the letter of the law and our faith's teachings, but far more importantly, the spirit behind it. I'm persuaded we need to achieve in the current hour a balance in relationship to the terms we use, how we use them, why we use them, and when we use them. And that's going to take a thoughtful and informed approach to linguistics, the use of language, because we all live in language. And we need to have a commitment to healthy community dynamics. And there's so much going on related to spiritual abuse right now 
that we need to revisit what is healthy human community and what are healthy human commitments. And if we can do that, we can prioritize faithfulness to the sacred text, theological accuracy, and psychological and mental health, and practices of ethics that are congruent with what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. For those of you that feel like these are things you want to talk about and have a dialogue about, I want you to comment, let me know, because I'm willing to host a dialogue on this and answer any questions you may have. I've spent 50 years now preaching the gospel, traveling around the world. I love the people of God. I love the body of Christ. I love the move of God. I love the very things God is doing. I also know it's time for us to see what needs to be reformed in so many ways so that we can say with David, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Blessings.